Shabbat Shalom to all of you and uh, welcome to our Karima project extract from the Arab Shabbat. Uh, today we are going to uh, speak about the Parsha Vaikra, but before we start, let's pray together. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, let us be in your presence in every sphere of our lives, whether we work or we are at school, we're studying, uh, we are meeting together during the week. Let us always be testimony of your presence in us, no matter what's happening around us and in our lives. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. So uh, this year, uh, it's very important uh, for all of us, many things are changing as families, as um, testimonies of Yeshua in our lives. This Parsha Vaikra celebrates a very special Shabbat today. So it's called Shabbat Parasha Zachor. And this is a Shabbat immediately preceding uh, the Feast of Purim. We're going to celebrate next weekend, next Shabbat. And uh, it's called Shabbat Zachor. So the Mafti, that as a special portion that I invite you to read within all the scriptures uh, Rabbi uh, Arel has suggested you to read, comes from the book of Devarim. Um, Parashat uh, Ki Tetze, chapter 25, verses 17 and 19, and deals with the commandment to remember what Amalek did to us. And it says, remember what Amalek did to you on the way upon your departure from Mitzrayim, from Egypt, how they perpetrated a cowardly and unprovoked attack you shall erase the memory of Amalek from the heavens. You shall not forget. And this is a command that Hashem said to the people of Israel, not to forget about what it was done at the time of Mitzrayim. And this is something that it's important for our time also, not to forget what happened in the past. So we might be wise in our choices and in our faith. And this commandment to remember Amalek is one of the 613 commandments. So it's, it's really important to remember. It is incumbent thereof, uh, therefore, I'm sorry, upon every person to attend services on Shabbat Zakor in order to hear this special reading and remember its message. But what is the connection between erasing the memory of Amalek and Purim? Well, the wicked, um, the wicked Amman who in, intended to destroy all the Jews is one day and claim uh, their spoils was the descendant of Agag, who was the king of Amalek in the time of King Shaul. And thus we know that Amman was an Amalekite this is why our sages ordained carrying out the commandment of remembering to erase the memory of Amalek before Purim. Zakor means remember, and remember means do not forget. So the Aftora, the additional portion pro from the prophets, which is read after Parsha, comes from the book of Shmuel 1, so the first book of uh, Samuel, chapter 15, verses 1 through 34. And uh, we have the Tanit Esther that is observed on Wednesday, March 16, on the 13th of the month of Adar, the second, uh, followed by Purim. And as you know, we observe the fast uh, of Esther. There are people observing the three, complete three days, others which do just one day. It's also important to do the fast, not only of uh, food and whatever we usually eat, um, but it's important to fast according to Isaiah 58, as we know that Hashem 
is pleased when we fast from anything that is not aligned to his life. So let's also pray to know exactly what Hashem wants us to put off our lives. Matter, um, maybe it's a relationship that needs to be restored. Maybe it's something in our heart that it's still retaining our redemption from freedom, uh, from past bondages. Maybe it's something like unforgiveness or anger, even uh, something in our families which need to be restored and through isaiah 58 we all can reestablish what has been lost or what has been uh, destroyed by a satan so i would suggest you also to read through isaiah 58 during the week before fasting amen and then always in, in accordance to your uh, medical needs you might not be able to fast completely, but it's important to fast, as I said, according to the scripture and not only from food. So you can all dedicate uh, El Parsha or any other section of the Devash magazine that is the fruit of the Kadima project to and in honor or in memory of someone close to you. But for further information, you can contact us at contact at makaseshaltikva.org and you will receive all the clarification regarding it. Also, we are promoting during this time of Purim and pre-Pesach, all the um, package of the entire year of the Vash magazine that you can receive as a special offer. And I invite you to look at the special offer as a chance to have all the year of all the parshot and all the teaching uh, we have done and we are still doing so that you can um, have a, a way to give the best of your offering to Hashem at the beginning of the month of Nisan. So that you may, may be blessed and bless your family, your Mishpacha, till the fourth generation through this offering. Amen. And regarding the offering, you can also look at our uh, Facebook page and go through our website and look at the offerings. And how to do the offering is really simple. You can do it through uh, the PayPal and you can simply use a code or you can just write to us if you're not sure about it and we will guide you through because Hashem is pleased to receive your offering today. Amen. So for Eight days, the Jewish nation celebrates the inauguration of the Mishkan. It seems everybody has a reason to celebrate, except for Moshe. He is the only one who didn't get to donate to the traveling temple. Hashem assures him that the people's job is done, but Moshe has just begun. With all these altars, someone has to teach the sacrificial rules. It's Corban College then. 101 in this exciting episode of Kadima Project and the Vash Magazine. So the Parsha Vaikra contains 16 mitzvot, 11 mitzvot ase, which are the positive commandment, and mitzvot lo tase, which are the negative commandments, the prohibitions. Also 111 pesukim or sentences and 1,773 number of words, also 6,222, uh, I'm sorry, letters. So lots of letters contained in this Parsha Vaikra. 
In our last uh, episode, the Bene Israel celebrated the Hanukkah, the inauguration of the Amishkan for eight days. During these eight days, Hashem instructed Moshe in the rituals performed by Kohanim and Levihim. And as our Parsha opens, the Shekinah has descended and filled the Kodesh Akadoshim, the holiest part of the Mishkan. Hashem informs Moshe that he will meet with him in the Mishkan, but Moshe won't cross the line because it's so thick. Shekinah, the presence of Hashem, it's so thick that he cannot enter. There is no way for him to enter into the Mishkan. So the, uh, the presence of the Lord was tangible. You could touch it. Amen. And here is one reason why. Moshe is standing in front of the Mishkan, surrounded by all the Jewish people who have contributed materials to the building of the Mishkan. He has the only one who gave nothing. <laughs> so Hashem tells him, their job is done, but yours has just begun. Come into the Mishkan and I will give you instructions concerning the korbanot, the sacrifices, so that you may teach them to the Kohanim and Bnei Israel. So this is a new step forward in the relationship between Hashem and the people of Israel, and between Hashem and Moshe, because he is becoming a teacher. He is teaching the teachers, the, the Kohanim, how to do their job. It's a teacher training. Okay, so it's the level of understanding in Moshe is, is even higher than it was, because not only he received the vision, the footprint of the Mishkan, and it, it basically gave him to the people so that they may realize it. But now he's teaching the Kohanim, the so-called future uh, priests, to do the job as Hashem wants them to, not the way they want. And this sometimes is really hard because we want to show people how Hashem wants them to serve him, but many are not prepared and they want to become teachers before time. And this will cause lots of loss. You know, we, we will see actually two of them dying because they will do something that Hashem is not pleased with. And this is a great lesson for all of us because if Hashem tells us something that we might not understand, it's good to do it. Anyway, even though people around us do not understand what we're doing, but as far as we do what Hashem wants us to do, that's great. That's perfect because it's his will that needs to be pleased, not man will. Okay, it's not man's will that needs to be pleased. We are not called to please man. And when we understand this, after years, we will see the fruit of our labor. It doesn't come as soon as we start. The fruit of our labor comes at the end of our work in us. So let's speak about the birds and the beasts, which are the Corban animals, the animals which were sacrificed for Hashem, in honor of Hashem. So there are three types of unblemished kosher domestic animals because they were be, uh, they were supposed to come from the flock they were not supposed to be wild animals they were supposed to come from the flock but why because Hashem wants us to take the best of the best we would eat and just give it to him because if we select that best it's surely something that we really sacrifice to give out. And that's called the korban. Something we struggle to pay because it's so good. 
we would like to have on our plate, but we're going to give to Hashem because that's what Hashem wants from us. The best of the best, we would never give anyone. That's what is called living sacrifice. So korban animals uh, may be used for korbanot in the Mishkan, and each one reminds us of the greatness of the avot, or the forefathers. So the first is the ox. Abraham ran to get an ox to serve his guests. Remember what he went through <laughs> to get that ox. Second is a sheep. Its hack is compared to a lamb when he only uh, he was brought as a sacrifice. Third is the goat. Jacob was instructed by Rivka to take two kid goats from the flock and bring them to his father. Okay, so these are the three animals we are speaking of. Only two kinds of birds can be offered. The first is a mature turtle, doves, and second is a young doves or pigeons. And they're all coming from the flock and from their own animals. They're not wild animals. So the Korban categories, categories, I'm sorry, are introduced in the Parsha Vaikra. The first burnt offering is called Ola. And let's say that you are just in the mood to donate a Korban as a gift to Hashem of your own free will. You have a choice of giving an ox, a lamb, a goat, a turtle dog, or a pigeon. Based on your bank book, you bring, you bring whichever one you can afford. The birds may be male or female. The animals, however, must be male. But don't think Hashem won't appreciate your korban for your unsolicited unsolicited effort, Hashem will forgive any sins that involve neglecting a positive mitzvah, transgression of certain negative commandments, and thinking sinful thoughts. What we were talking about before, as Isaiah 58 says, if we do all the best we can externally, and we look like models, but internally we're thinking garbage, about others, that's not good. So it's good to review our thoughts and renew our minds. And I'm speaking first to myself when I speak this way, because we all are sinners. Amen. So this korban is completely burned on the Mizbayach, the altar. The second korban, Minchah, is the meal offering. If a person is too poor to afford even a bird offering, he can offer a korban mincha made up of flour, oil, and spices. The combo can be prepared five different ways, one raw, two baked, and two fried. With all these varieties, uh, variates, the Torah forbid, forbids the use of leavened dough. The dough may not rise. And these are shades of Pesach because we are getting closer to Pesach when we're not going to be eating any leavened bread. We're going to eat unleavened bread. Okay. So Kemitsa, the Kohen, carries the Mincha offering to the southwest corner of the Mishbayach. He places his hand in the vessel containing the flour mixture and bending three middle fingers over his paw, he fills it with flour. He uses the thumb and pinky to wipe off any excess flour. And this procedure is called kemitsa. This fistful topped by the spices and salted, is then burned on the Mizbayak. So the rest of the Mincha is divided among the Kohain 
Kohanim for them to eat. Then third, Korban Shlamim, peace offering. The Korban Shlamim, which may be a male or female animal, is a peace shalom offering. Let's say you're feeling extra special and everything's going your way. That never happens. <laughs> but when it does, it's miraculous. So the shlamim is a great way to make Hashem a part of that feeling. Shlamim means peace, shalom, because everyone shares in this korban. The Mizbayak gets its part, and the owner of his family get most of the animal to eat. And even the Kohanim get in on the action as they receive the chest and leg to eat, which are chest and leg are the priestly portions of the animals. They're always offered to the Kohanim because they're the best. <laughs> so now there are different kinds of korban khatat listed in Parsha Vaikra. This is the most common example. Let's say you make a mistake and accidentally transgress certain types of negative commandments. You must bring a korban khatat. This korban must be a female goat or a sheep only. Bow of the Kohain Gadol. If a Kohain Gadol ruled in error that a particular act is permitted and he himself performed this act in sin, he must bring a bow as a korban. Again, this only applies to certain sins. Then we have the bowl for hidden matters, something that you haven't shown in an open way. If the Sanhedrin, the 70 members, Jewish Supreme Court issued a mistaken ruling as a result of which a majority of Bene Israel transgressed a negative commandment, the Sanhedrin must bring a bowl as a korban. Again, this only applies to certain sins. Then we have the king's e-goat. If the king makes a mistake and accidentally transgress a negative commandment, only certain ones, he must bring a korban khatat, except that his korban must be a male goat. Ultimately, we have the korban ole beyored the adjustable sacrifice. This korban katat is brought when a person lies under oath claiming he does not know of facts. In a case that he really knows about or accidentally lies under oath or enters the Mishkan while impure. This korban calls for a female goat or sheep. However, if a person cannot afford an animal, one may bring two turtle doves or pigeons. The first bird offered is the korban khatat, while the second bird is a korban ola. If one cannot even afford the birds, he must bring a mincha sin offering, cons uh, I'm sorry, consisting only of wheat meal with no oil or spices. This is why this korban is called korban ole beyored, the adjustable sacrifice, because oil, even at that time, was pretty expensive. The requirements are adjusted according to a person's means. Now, let's look at the korban asham, the guilt offering. There are five reasons to bring a guilt offering. Only three are mentioned in this Parsha. The first, let's say Reuben steals from Shimon and then Reuben swears in Bet Din, the court, that he did not steal. But Reuben starts to feel guilty. He must return what he stole plus one fifth of the value more. Then he brings the Korban Asham Gezai lot for stealing. The second, if a person uses something that's dedicated to the Mishkan for personal 
pleasure, like wood that is dedicated for burning on the Mishpayak. This is called meila, embezzlement. For this scene, a person pays back the value plus one fifth and brings a ram, a ram as a korban asham meilot. Third, if a person eats meat that contains fat, but is not sure if the fat is high lev, forbidden fat, he brings an asham talui, doubt. If he later finds out that it really was forbidden fat, he must then bring a korban hatat. Now, there are more mitzvot. The Parsha introduces two new commandments. One is the mitzvah for a kohain to solve all sacrifices on the mitzvah. The second mitzvah, uh, mitzvah is about stolen objects. If a guy, for example, steals a salami, for example, he isn't allowed to eat it and pay the owner back with money. It is a mitzvah to return the original salami. <laughs> if he already ate it, he has to pay the value plus an additional fifth, the 20%. The Parsha Vaikra also mentions not to eat blood or certain fats of animals. So until now, we have seen lots of detail, details which are going to continue through other uh, por uh, portions of Torah. Now let's look at the rules of a korban. Hashem explains to Moshe the basic rules of bringing a korban. This is the way it's done. So this is a basic training. Moshe is going to take from Hashem and is going to pass to the Kohanim. First, Ahava bringing a korban. Let's say you want to bring a korban. The first step is for you, yourself, to bring the animal to the azara, the courtyard of the Mishkan, semicha. The semicha, the second, is resting the hands. Next, you take both hands and place them on the animal's head with all your might. Third, Vidui, confession. During Semicha, if you are bringing the sacrifice to make up for a sin, it's time to confess and not edited versions either. You've got to say, I have sinned in such and such a way and I did Teshuvah. May this Korban make up for my sin. Four, Shechita, slaughtering. Now the animal is slaughtered on the north side of the Azara, even by a known Kohain. It means it can be slaughtered by somebody who hasn't been um, appointed yet as a Kohanim. Okay, it's a Kohanim in training. Five, Kabbalah Adam receiving the blood. A Kohain catches the flowing blood in a kli sharait, a special pen built for this purpose. Six, olaha, walking. The koain takes the pen with the blood over the misbayak. Seven, zerika, sprinkling. The koain sprinkles some of the blood onto the misbayak. Eight, Shefihat Sherahim is the pouring the left over blood. The coin pours the left over blood onto the base of the Mishbayak where it drains. Then we have the ninth <laughs> Afshait Veni Tuach, the skinning and severing. Severing. The animal is skinned and cut up. Tenth, adacha, rinsing. The pieces of the korban are rinsed. Eleven, melicha veaktara, salting and burning. The parts of the animal that are burned are brought to the ramp of the mishbayak. The gid anashe, the sciatic nerve in the animal's thigh, 
is removed and the koain places the animal parts in the fire where they are completely burned up. So there are 11 steps to follow in order to follow the rules of the korban. That's what Moshe firstly passed to the koain, koanim to be trained well before they start the sacrifices practice. So for the birds, sacrificing a bird is a whole different story. Ever hear, uh, ever heard that a koain, koain's thumb nail was long and sharp? Well, it's true. That's because when it comes to sacrificing a bird, there is no knife involved. The koain just uses his nail to slice through the wine pipe, throat and neck bone. Wow. With four fingers, the koain holds the neck and with the thumb of the same hand he slices. I don't know about you, but <laughs> for me, it could be really difficult. This step is called melicha, that is nipping. This is one of the most difficult jobs in the Mishkan requiring great skill. Next comes Mitzul Adam, pressing the blood. The Kohain squeezes the bird's blood out onto the Mizbayak. Now the bird's head is salted and burnt on the Mizbayak. This is called Aktarat Arosh. The bird's intestines and crop are disposed of in the Beit Adeshen, a place on the eastern side of the Mishbayak. Lastly, the Kohain pulls the bird apart by hand into two connected halves. Not split completely. The two parts remain attached. The bird is then burned completely on the Mishbayak. I would prefer to sacrifice other types of animals rather than birds, but you know, uh, this is my personal thought. Now, let's tune in next week as Hashem speaks to the songs of Aaron about, you guessed it, more korbanot <laughs> in the next Parsha next week and part of the Karima project. But before we leave, let's speak about the Midrash for this Parsha. As if our adventures in the Midbar aren't spicy enough with the Erev, Rav, and all, Hashem commands the Bene Israel to build the Mishkan as a sign of healing. And just as Moshe is about to offer the first sacrifice, Hashem adds salt to the mixture. Salt. This Midrash is all about salt. Apparently, Hashem's had a soft spot for salt since day two of creation. Here is what happened. Once the chaos of creation cleared, day two brought on a new challenge. The waters just ran rampant up in the heavens, down on earth, mixing and sloshing with no clear divide. Hashem commanded the waters to divide into heavenly waters above the earth and lower waters that cover the earth. Well, that was fine to the heavenly water. They got to be closer to Shemaim. But what about the water that got stuck on earth? They too yearned to be close to Hashem. That's where the soul comes in. The comfort is in the lower waters. Hashem made a pact with the sea that its salt would be placed on any korban that would be put on the Mishbayak. Additionally, fresh water would be poured on the Mishbayak every Sukkot in a special service called Nisuch Amaim, water libation. So here's a good question. Why wait until Sukkot? 
why not splash the bees vayak with fresh water every time? Don't worry, the heavenly fire can cut through a little dampness if necessary. One answer is that all water eventually makes it up to the sky by evaporation. It is only the salt of the sea that is condemned to earth permanently, as we all know. Salt is a sign of the covenant between Hashem and the Jewish people. Just as no person can live without salt, the world cannot survive without the study of Torah. That's why we place salt on the table at mealtime, to remind us to speak words of Torah at the table where people are eating. As long as they're where Mishkan and Beit Amikdash Korbanot, salt was an important part of the Avoda. When the Beit Amikdash was destroyed, salt found its way to the table of every Jewish home. Our rabbis teach that the table in a Jewish home is like a mishvayak, is an altar. And that's why through the redemption, will be served as his altar, as his table, at his table, in a beautiful banquet. He has prepared for us to sit and eat with him. And all those which will receive a Mashiach in their hearts as their redeemer will be at that table. Whenever we eat bread, we should sprinkle some salt as we do every Shabbat before eating. When we bless the bread, we put salt, we sprinkle some salt on it to remind us that we are in the presence of Hashem. Even though there is no temple yet, even though there is no uh, dedication yet, each, every one of us is the temple of Hashem when in our body and our heart, our mind, our soul, Moshiach Yeshua resides, who is the fulfillment and the completion of the Torah and all the redemption that Hashem has prepared for us to be at that table. So let's think about it when we are celebrating Shabbat together. And when we are praying for our Jewish brothers and sisters, which haven't been redeemed yet in Moshiach Yeshua. Let's remember that they are gonna be part of that banquet at that table in the presence of Hashem, if they will choose to be redeemed through the Moshiach, Yeshua. Let's pray for their redemption every day, brothers and sisters, especially during these times of uh, uh, big challenges. Let's pray together before we conclude our meeting. Abinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we come before your banquet table, your mishbayak, you have prepared before us to be at that altar, to be at that table, redeemed through the Moshiach Yeshua. You have prepared for all of us, Jews and Gentiles, a mishbayak, an altar where all of us will be redeemed. Let us make the good choice. Let us be prepared. Let us be redeemed. Let us let accept the Moshiach Yeshua in our hearts so that we might be redeemed in Moshiach Yeshua, the one and only way to be intimate with you, to be sitting at that table, to be sitting at that altar, that Mishbayah and receive that healing he wants for each one of us, each and every 
member of our family. I pray that all children, all adults, all young adults, all women, all elders will receive this redemption today and will sit one day as his presence in his kingdom. In Yeshua's name, amen. Shabbat shalom to all of you and see you next week.